very much, Colin. I think we've got with us Rania Masri. Uh, she's a sh social justice and anti-war activist, uh, and she's actually uh, visiting Britain to speak at Tom Hunter's uh, memorial, which happens every year. Uh, so she's going to be talking about BDS, about colonialism and racism in the context of Palestine. Uh, so I introduce Rania. Thank you. Well, thank you all. I think it'll be easier if, if you gentlemen want to sit here just so that I won't be in your, your line of vision. Um, having come from Beirut, I have to say thank you for not making it absolutely freezing in England. It's just <coughs> bitterly cold, but not absolutely freezing. So thank you for that, and thank you for coming out today. Um, I always ask myself when I'm asked to speak about Palestine, which I've been doing for all my life, where to start? And what do we talk about, given everything that's happening to us and has been happening to us since the 30s? And for me, I want to start with the story of Abid Qutqut. I don't know how many of you have heard of his story. He's Palestinian who spent most of his life in a refugee camp, in Taisha refugee camp in the West Bank. And he decided to return to a land that his family had inherited, which happened to be in so-called Area C in the West Bank. And Area C, not only as our colleague stated, is fully controlled by the occupying Israeli authorities, but also comprises approximately 60% of the occupied West Bank. <coughs> so just to, to put it into perspective. So he wanted to return to this land that also overlooks his original village in 1948 Palestine, which is a village called al Walaja. So he wanted to be closer to his hometown. And this particular area where he was in now, in Area C, happened to be controlled by the illegal Israeli Jerusalem municipality. And again, we need to recognize that Jerusalem is also considered occupied. So the Israeli Jerusalem municipality told this gentleman that no, he could not change the status quo. Okay. He could not change the status quo, which meant he could not build anything. So he went into a cave, literally. He went into a cave, which is where we see him right now. And he planted some olive trees, he planted a permaculture, he had a little outdoor toilet, and he tried to bring in electricity. And they told him, no, you cannot do that, you're not allowed to dig a well, you're not allowed to do anything of the kind. He spent 10 years in the courts, until finally the Israeli court stated that Abed Qutqut could stay in his cave, but could not alter the land, which therefore means he was denied water, electricity, and safe passage. So then the police came and they destroyed his olive trees, they destroyed his little electricity out, and they destroyed his outdoor toilet. He then refurnished, quote unquote, they then destroyed it again. Very recently at the age of 54, Abd Qutqut died. To me, he represents all of us Palestinians because the Israeli court makes it very clear, we are only allowed to live in caves. We are not allowed to have water, we are not allowed to have electricity, we are not allowed to have safe passage of any kind. And this does not only apply to Asqutkut living in his own inherited land, which the Israeli court did not contest, by the way. It applies to all Palestinians throughout the land of Palestine. We can live in caves. Earlier this month, Benjamin Netanyahu announced the destruction of more than 400 Palestinian homes in this Area C in the West Bank. More than 400 Palestinian homes. Last year, Israel demolished the homes of more than 1,177 Palestinians. This was the largest home demolition in ever, actually, since people have been recording home demolitions. And every year, we issue the same statement. This year has been the largest home demolition incurred by the Israeli Authority in the occupied territory. More than 20,000 Palestinian homes in occupied Jerusalem have been, quote, shortlisted to be demolished. Since the occupation of the West Bank in 1967, more than 27,000 Palestinian homes and other structures have been demolished. And again, these 27,000 homes, that's an understatement because Israel considers a building to be one structure. Okay, so again, we need to think about these are almost 100,000 Palestinians who have been deprived of their home in areas that Israel does not contest as theirs. Okay. And of course there's Gaza. 
And the Palestinians in Gaza, 80% of whom are Palestinian refugees from 1948, that's why calling them Gazans, I find to be deeply problematic. Okay, they are Palestinians in Gaza. Again, the testimony in Gaza remains very clear. You are only allowed to live in caves. More than 100,000 homes were destroyed in the 33 days of the bombing, US-led, UK-supported Israeli destruction of Gaza. More than 100,000 homes. People right now in Gaza are living under trees and living in tents. There has not been one single project built since the summer. In the past six months, not one single project built. What we need is 1.5 million tons of cement and only 27,000 tons of cement have been included. And we could go in in the discussion period at length as to the so-called rebuilding and the numerous conditions that the Israelis, including the United Nations, have been applying on the Palestinians, which go beyond this aspect of demanding that Hamas be disarmed. I personally, for the record, will say it again and again, I am opposed to the disarmament of any single Palestinian faction. We have the right to carry arms, we have the right to choose how to defend ourselves and how to liberate our homes, as any other occupied oppressed population does. Just last week, more than 80 homes in Gaza were flooded, and hundreds of Palestinians were forced to evacuate because not only are we enduring a very harsh winter, not only are we enduring harsh rains, but the Israelis actually opened the gates of several dams on the border with the Gaza Strip. Water levels reached more than three meters. Just as in the West Bank, we are only allowed to live <coughs> in caves. And I have to say, one of the comments that we make about Gaza is that it is the world's largest open air prison. And Banksy, the English graffiti artist who recently made his way to Gaza said, it's actually not a prison because it's a bit unfair to prisons and I'm quoting here directly. Seems a bit unfair to prisons considering that they don't have their electricity and drinking water cut off randomly almost every day. And these home demolitions that we hear about, whether it's through military air power or through caterpillar bulldozers, custom made <coughs> for the Israeli authorities, are not only in the West Bank and Jerusalem and Gaza, but also against Palestinians with Israeli citizenships. And the shutzpah here, the absolute audacity of the Israeli authority, is they actually ask, demand of the Palestinians, after their home has been demolished, to pay the cost of the demolition. So they charge us the bullet with which they shoot us. We have 80,000 Palestinians in the Nega within what is called Israel, what we call 1948 Palestine, to whom Israel refers to as unrecognized villages. And this whole concept of, I see you, you exist, but I will define you as not existing. Define a village that we recognize as an unrecognized village, so to deny it electricity and water and to deny the right for shelter. 80,000 Palestinians are living in these so-called <coughs> unrecognized villages, denied basic services, although they have Israeli citizenships. And it's not just homes that have been demolished. Just this past Thursday, Israel issued a demolition order for a school <coughs> near Hebron. And Hebron, I prefer to call it by its original name, Al Khalil. And they issued a demolition order for a school. Not because they, they accused the school, as they did during the bombardments of Gaza, of housing weapons or housing sort of called terrorists, but simply because they want to expand another 50 square kilometers into that area. So they were going to demolish a school. And I have to say this, we're not surprised. I have yet to be surprised by anything the Israeli government has done. They have been extraordinarily consistent since the early 40s. Extraordinarily consistent, and we need to recognize this. Nothing that they have done is surprising. Not the military violence, that has been consistent and arguably has escalated, not the economic violence of depriving people their right to an economic livelihood, not the continuous theft of both land and life, and I say the theft of life because the numbers of Palestinians that are thrown into detentions, where the Israeli government grants itself the right to pick up any Palestinian, throw them into detention without charge for six months, and then renew that charge for another six months, renew that charge for another six months. And most recently, the Israeli government declared that they will maintain their night raids against children. And the idea here that they go into homes at night, 
to detain children, 10, 11, 12 year olds at night and throw them in to these detention facilities, they have decided they will maintain it. The deliberate forced decline in education, the deliberate forced decline in health care, the institutionalized racism, all of this we know. And therefore we're not surprised that popular racism amongst the Israeli Jews has increased. So that the latest poll issued before the summer of the war on Gaza was that 84% of Jewish Israelis approve discrimination. They approve discrimination. That makes the South, where I grew up in the United States, seem quite egalitarian and just, even during the time of Jim Crow. Again, none of this is surprising. And none of this is surprising because the mere existence of a Palestinian in the historic land of Palestine is itself deemed a threat. We, we have to recognize this. Our mere existence is regarded as a demographic threat. Not what we do, not what we say, not how we organize, but the mere fact that we exist. That can be quite scary. And when we look at the individuals who have chosen to stand with us in real solidarity to put their bodies on the line, and we examine how the Israeli government has responded to them. Tom Herndale, for example, who came from Manchester, who 11 years ago was shot in the head by an Israeli sniper in Gaza, while he put himself between children and the Israeli military. <coughs> and a week before he was killed, actually he fell into a coma and died later, but a week before he was shot, Rachel Corey, who comes from Washington State in the northwestern part of the United States, was run over deliberately by a caterpillar bulldozer while she was trying to protect a Palestinian home that had been demolished earlier and that later was demolished. Now very recently, the Israeli Supreme Court ruled that the Israeli military cannot be held responsible for damages in a war zone. And they considered, at that time, the death of Rachel Corey to have been committed in a war zone. Okay. And Rachel Corey's family responded in a statement and they said, and I quote, we have come to see through this experience how deeply all of Israel's institutions are implicated in the impunity enjoyed by the Israeli military. This decision amounts to judicial sanction of immunity for Israeli military forces when they commit injustices and human rights violations. Again, none of us were surprised because the ruling by the Israeli Supreme Court, as, and this is what is critical to understand, as with the ruling of all the courts that side with the occupier and the oppressor, always maintains the domination of the strong against the weak. And by doing so, it literally dismisses the lives of those that they consider to be others. And again, as somebody who carries a US citizenship, who lived 20 years in the United States, I cannot help but make a comparison between this Israeli court ruling and the continuous court rulings in the United States that have acquitted U.S. policemen for shooting black teenagers unarmed with their hands up time and time and time again. I cannot help but remember that every 36 hours in the United States, actually no, I'm mistaken, every 28 hours in the United States, a black man is killed either by the U.S. police force or by another kind of security agency within the United States. To me, these acts are linked, because in both our cases, we are deemed allowable, we are deemed invisible, our deaths are deemed dismissible. It is okay to kill us. We are not surprised. Just as we are not surprised very recently by a report that came out from the Physicians for Human Rights that details Israel's army's double-tap bombing. A double-tap bombing is when you bomb first, and then you have um, the emergency facilities, the Red Cross, the Red Crescent, others who come in to help the wounded, and there's immediately another bombing to particularly attack the nurses and the doctors that go in to help the wounded, particularly to attack them. The Red Crescent described the double tap, double tap practice as one of the central factors behind the death and injuries of their medical teams. 23 medical personnel were killed, 83 were wounded, 45 ambulances were damaged. The critical question that we have to ask ourselves <coughs> as organizers, as people of conscience, as people outraged, is why do we remain so surprised? 
the bombing in Gaza last summer, it was like this was the first time Gaza had been bombed. It had been bombed every two years. And we're expecting another bombing. We're expecting more home demolitions throughout the area. We're expecting increased attacks against Palestinian lives, against civil rights, political freedoms, against all of it. We are expecting it to escalate. We are expecting it to escalate. So therefore, what can we do as organizers, as individuals, as activists, as a collective, to try to thwart these structures of violence, to try to hold them back and to support the people on the ground who are doing heroic things by simply existing? And here I have to think of George Orwell, because we are living in a time of universal deceit. Most definitely, this is a time of universal deceit. Animal Farm in 1984 could not have been proven more accurate than these years we are living in. So therefore, the mere fact of telling the truth becomes revolutionary. And here's something really critical that we can do. We need to transform the narrative. Because the narrative as it is being presented thus far by mainstream media, by Western press, and I would include The Guardian and The Independent in this, who have really gone downhill over the past five years. Mm -hmm. The Guardian no longer is this leftist paper. I can't even call it a liberal paper. I don't know what it tends to resemble. Okay. For The Guardian and The Independent, thank you. What is regarded as calm in the land of Palestine is when Palestinians are killed silently, when pa Palestinian fishermen off the coast of Gaza are shot at, and there's no response from Palestinians. That's a calm, because every day this happens. Okay, so their calm is violence committed against us. And I have to say also for the record that there was this use of language that became very popular in the summer against Gaza. And it was said by people from the left as well as from people from the right, which is they looked at how many women and children were killed in the war on Gaza. And as a feminist, and as somebody who considers myself to be Palestinian, I found that deeply offensive. Deeply offensive to separate our women from our men for a number of reasons. One, it presents our women as victims seeking help from the outside, from whom, okay, all too often, Western press, particularly the United States and their government, seek to present brown women as needing help from the white man to save us from the brown man. <laughs> and they've used this logic in Afghanistan, they've used this logic in Iraq to such an extent that an Israeli military spokesperson even presented Hamas as being a problematic to Palestinian women. Therefore, would it be good for us if Hamas were destroyed? And I say, as a feminist, we can take care of our men. The other problem that is even more significant is it presents civilians and separates them <coughs> from combatants. And it presents all men automatically as combatants. And I've got two problems here. You can be a man and not be a fighter. You can be a woman and be a fighter. And most powerfully, you can be a combatant and have your life mourned and have your sacrifice appreciated. And I refuse to separate amongst the civilians who have been killed and the fighters who have been killed. Because to do so, it's as if I am accepting the murder of our fighters. And I cannot do so because they are truly freedom fighters, regardless how we may think of violence. And what I found to be so powerful is during the Israeli attack on Gaza, Israeli soldiers themselves were saying when they tried to invade Gaza that they thought they were in the south of Lebanon. That these men fought with the strength and the technique <coughs> and the bravery of Hezbollah fighters. And this is according to Israeli soldiers. And every time I say it, I get chills <coughs> to think that these are men who were united under the sanctions. We had four different political parties coming together, organizing together to try to defend their land under a blockade, under massive destruction, and still, despite all that, the Israeli military felt them to be strong. That level of resilience cannot but be appreciated and recognized. There's another problem with the narrative because Israel is continually presented as the liberal democracy in the region and sometimes even referred to as the only democracy in the region. And we're going to talk about that, about what it is to be a democracy. And here I have to refer to Peter Beinart. He considers himself to be a liberal Zionist, which I personally consider to be 
an oxymoron. And he argues, and I'm quoting here, if we accept for the sake of argument that the creation of a Palestinian state roughly among the 1967 lines remains realistic and achievable, then there would be a problem. Because there would still be, and I'm using his words, there would still be 1.5 million Palestinian citizens of Israel within Israel. And this is a prospect, he writes, that causes Zionists considerable anxiety. And he's among those Zionists that feel very anxious about this problem. Because, he says, and I'm quoting, I am not asking Israel to be utopian. I am not asking it to allow Palestinians who were forced out in 1948 to return to their homes. Thereby, he actually recognizes that we were forced out of our homes and we didn't simply get up and go on vacation. He continues, and I quote, I'm not even asking it to allow full equal citizenships to Arab Israelis since that would require Israel no longer being a Jewish state. I'm actually pretty willing to compromise my liberalism for Israel's security and for its status as a Jewish state. What does that mean? What does that actually mean? That means I am willing to be a racist. I am willing to have separate laws for different communities. Okay? And I am fine with that. Absolutely fine with it. Now, it is, it is completely an individual's choice to have different politics. And God knows we are surrounded with people of various politics amongst us. But I do not believe it is an individual choice to compromise the rights of other people. That goes beyond an individual choice. We have the right not to seek our own rights, but we do not have the right to take away the rights of other people. So amidst this dialogue, when people talk about a two-state solution, I remember the words of Martin Luther King, who said that the two-state solution, and I'm paraphrasing him here, is the liberal Zionist version of separate but equal. They love the separate, the equal not so much. You can't be in any way claiming to be a democratic state, a liberal state, and yet call for such institutional discrimination. Now the larger question becomes, and I've been asked this time and time again, okay, am I in support of Israel's right to exist? I don't know how many people here have been asked this question. Do we support Israel's right to exist? And it, the, the question puzzles me. Because there is an implication in that question that the mere existence of a state means it has a right to exist. If Scotland had actually voted yes, the United Kingdom would have been altered. But nobody asked, do we support the United Kingdom's right to exist? That wasn't a discussion. Because people have the right to change their state. We don't raise these questions. And I argue very much that there is no state that has a right to exist. People have a right to exist. Communities have a right to exist. States? Not really. We change states. We've seen them changed. Okay? And most definitely, a racist, divisive regime has zero right to exist. Zero right to exist. The apartheid regime in South Africa had no right to exist. And the apartheid regime in Israel has no right to exist. Absolutely not. And then we get asked another question. Well, what about a Jewish state? Don't the Jews deserve a home? And I argue here there's a deep problem in defining a religious community as a nation. Because they cannot be a nation. They are a religious community. Nobody argues that Christians need a right to exist. You know, or Muslims need a right to exist. Or Baha'is, or Druze, or whoever. No, your faith is a personal aspect between you and God, as you tend to see her, okay, and not an, an ideal that grants a particular religious community the right to go to another land and demand it to be theirs due to their particular reading of the text. <coughs> there is no intrinsic right for that. Absolutely no intrinsic right. And we have to be making that very clear in our narrative and not shying away from it. And it does not mean we are anti-Semitic. It actually means we believe in something that we do believe in, which is equality, regardless of one's religion. Absolutely regardless of one's religion. And this isn't anything new. Inspired by the South African Freedom Charter and the 1998 Belfast Agreement, a group of intellectuals that included both Palestinians and Israelis 
set out similar principles in the 2007 One State Declaration. And one they wrote, and I quote, the historic land of Palestine belongs to all who live in it and to those who were expelled or exiled from it since 1948, regardless of religion, ethnicity, national origin, or current citizenship status. So no one's asking for the Israelis to be thrown into the sea. It belongs to all who live in it and to all who were exiled from it. And it continues. Any system of government must be founded on the principle of equality in civil, political, social, and cultural rights for all citizens. Power must be exercised with rigorous impartiality on behalf of all people in the diversity of their identity. Again, if you're going to say this, nobody would deny the statement. But somehow when we apply it in Palestine against the state of Israel, we're accused of being anti-Semitic. When I called for equality and justice on a debate on TV a few weeks ago, I was accused by the, the Zionist who was debating me of being an anti-Semitic. And I find that to be very interesting, how calls for equality, we get accused of being anti-Semitic. That needs to be broken down. States, we must demand that they stand before the bar of a higher law, which is fidelity to all human rights. And human rights are not a buffet. You can't pick and choose. You can't prioritize. You can't ask me, do I want my economic rights or my political rights? We want it all. And we're demanding it all, and I think all of us are worthy of it all. And yet in a lot of the narratives, we ask Palestinians to compromise. Could you give up on this? So set aside your weapons, and we'll allow you a little bit of cement to rebuild Gaza, so long as you tell us the plan of your home and how many people live there, so we'll be able to monitor you more and be able to know who you are and how you intend to organize. I go, absolutely not. That's a violation right there. So we demand this. And one of the things that we have to do is we have to be very clear in naming the offender and naming the crime. This goes back to empowering the narrative. Israel is not a democracy. Israel is an ethnocracy. Just like the United States is not a democracy, it has been defined very clearly as an oligarchy. If you have the money, you'll control the policies. You don't have the money, it doesn't make a damn difference. That's the United States now, and we claim it, and we recognize it, and we organize accordingly. <coughs> the United, the Israel is, by definition, an ethnocracy. An ethnocracy is when you have one community that is viewed as dominant and supreme over another community, according to its ethnicity. And that is, by definition, what Israel is. It cannot be a democracy and ethnocracy. It is, by definition, an apartheid state. And I'm just very briefly going to tell you the laws that define it so. The law of return, the absentee property law, and the citizenship law that means that any Jew anywhere in the world has a right to own land and to get citizenship while Palestinians who have lived there for hundreds of years are not. Second, there's no such thing as, as an Israeli nationality within Israel. They view the Israeli nationality as non-existent. Rather, they claim that there is something called a Jewish nationality and an Israeli citizenship. That in and of itself creates discrimination. Third, there's no guarantee anywhere in Israeli law of equality for Jewish and Palestinian citizens in Israeli law. Quite the opposite. Okay? And I can talk about numerous other institutionalized discriminatory practices. Institutionalized. Okay. Now what's powerful, what's really powerful, is that there has been a movement that is finally asking the right questions. And I have to say, a lot of it is coming from the United Kingdom, which is arguably the most powerful organizing bastion in Europe. Okay? University of Southampton, just in a few weeks, in mid-April, is organizing a conference entitled International Law in the State of Israel, Legitimacy, Responsibility, and Exceptionalism. For the first time ever, there will be an academic conference in the West questioning the legitimacy of Israel. This is remarkable. This is absolutely remarkable, regardless in my opinion, who speaks, who attends, <laughs> what all happens, this is a victory. The mere fact that the narrative has shifted enough that the legitimacy of the state of Israel can be questioned in an academic conference is a victory. Okay, we're naming the crime and we're recognizing it. The second thing we have to do is to recognize the right of the occupied to resist to recognize Palestinians as full human beings, neither victims, neither terrorists, but full human beings, not to 
compartmentalize us into one or the other, to acknowledge the right of the Palestinian people to resist colonialism and military occupation and to struggle for their liberation and self-determination. Without this open recognition, any talk about peace or justice is lame. Okay? And again, we may believe in nonviolence, we may choose not to believe in nonviolence. To me, that's secondary. We all learned in our history textbooks about the romantic nature of the French resistance against the Nazi occupation of France. That was exalted. Okay. I'm not necessarily calling for the same exaltation. I'm calling for the same liberty to choose our method of engagement. Third, the third challenge we have is we have to recognize that there are attacks against the BDS movement. And to me, I take any attack against BDS as a compliment. Nobody would be attacking you if you're not strong enough to be worthy of attack. So the mere fact that they're attacking, the mere fact that we were regarded by the Israeli government years ago, the Israeli government years ago said that there is a threat of Iranian nuclear weapons and Hezbollah. They put that on one hand, and on the other hand, and this is their words, they put the BDS. So according to the Israeli government, we are as strong as Hezbollah and the Iranian nuclear weapons, which Iran does not have nuclear weapons. Wow! If that doesn't make you feel strong. Okay. And every year since, the Israeli government has been putting more and more and more and more money to defeat the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, which has become the largest global, decentralized, civil society movement focused on an objective. Period. Stunning how strong it is. Okay. So it becomes natural that we're going to be expecting attacks from everywhere. Now the latest attack comes from the US Congress. This was just, you know, a week ago, <coughs> two members of the US Congress have introduced a bill that would turn a, ta turn a trade deal. Y'all are familiar with the Transatlantic Trade and Investment mm -hmm. Partnership, right? Hmm. And you know how much it supports sovereignty and democracy and labor unions and, and the working class. And, <laughs> yeah. We call it NAFTA, not on steroids, but NAFTA empowered to such an extent. It's, it's a horrific partnership. And what these congressional men are trying to do, and they are men, these two individuals, is they want to include within this transatlantic trade and investment partnership, they want to include within it a, um, a bill that would compel all 28 European Union members to crack down on European groups participating in BDS. They view us as that much of a stress. The deal would prohibit BDS campaigns in solidarity with Palestinians and by so doing, it adds to the clear conviction that the TTIP is actually designed to undermine European democracy. Because clearly the US has no right to determine what peoples in Europe choose to organize for or against. The bill not only would compel them, these 28 U EU member states, to crack down on European groups, it also calls, and I'm quoting, for surveillance and information gathering on politically motivated acts of boycott, divestment from, and sanctions against Israel. Surveillance. And this surveillance would then be delivered to the US Congress every six months. Okay, so now we're talking about combining a destructive economic partnership, quote unquote, multinationals in partnership, with increased surveillance on communities, which we know surveillance has been increasing against communities around the world, including in Europe, with the increasing movement for BDS. So, and by so recognizing this challenge, we also recognize the myriad of issues that we would feel compelled to also organize for and against. We organize against surveillance, and we organize against any further undermining of national sovereignty and any further so-called free trade deals. And we know these, these deals are in no way free. The bill further specifies its targets as any person, organization, or entity that prohibits or otherwise decides against, quote, doing business with Israel, with Israeli entities, or in Israeli-controlled territory. That's pretty big pretty expensive, okay? And I would say thank you to those congressional officials for viewing us as strong enough to warrant surveillance. <coughs> Fourth challenge we have is we have to recognize that the very root of the problem is racism. 
the very root of the problem is racism. So we cannot pick and choose the racist struggles. We cannot pick and choose in the sense that I was asked recently by a journalist, you know, why there is an increased um, racism within Israel against Israeli Jews of color, Israeli and Jews that are coming in from Africa, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I told him it is typical for a country that has been built on racism to then experience racism against others. And at the same time, the Israeli society is one that has been built from the start with different layers of Jewish equality, so to speak. But fundamentally, when he asked me, what about European governments and US governments responding to this act of racism against Africans in Israel, I said, we reject any hypocritical statements. And for a community to say, we are against the sterilization of Ethiopian Jewish women by the state of Israel because they don't want that demography growing while not equally condemning the demographic threat they define Palestinians to be is hypocritical and racist. Which then means for us who work in the BDS campaign, the same applies to us. Okay? To work with and to identify acts of racism committed against any person of color in the communities with which you organize and with which you live. That's the core of BDS, is the dismantling of racism. The fifth challenge is to recognize that we are strong. And it's easy when we're faced with this monster that we have around us, which is not simply the apartheid state of Israel, but the apartheid state of Israel supported by these numerous <coughs> European, Australian, Canadian, North American, etc., governments, military, diplomats, etc., etc. It's easy to feel small, it's easy to feel depressed, it's easy to feel weak. We are quite strong, and I don't say that with emotional rhetoric. I say that truly, the amount of work, the amount of success that BDS has managed to do just in the past 10 years is stunning. It's stunning. Multinationals such as G4S and Viola have lost contracts with, pu with public authorities around the world, around the world. And just this month, just this month, I want to tell you three success stories, okay? 400 UK artists pledged to boycott Israel where they said, and I quote, we support the Palestinian struggle for freedom, justice, and equality in response to the calls from Palestinian artists and cultural workers for a cultural boycott of Israel. <coughs> we pledge to accept neither professional invitations to Israel nor funding from any institution linked to its government until it complies with international laws and universal principles of human rights. It's beautiful. And we have to recognize when these artists make these statements that they're making them against significant pressure put against them by the Israeli government and lucrative seduction put in front of them by the Israeli government. These are strong statements. The other major victory is we had the largest student body in the United States. The University of California student body okay, has agreed to pass BDS. And it wasn't even controversial. The vote was 9 to 1. 9 to 1. BDS victory and it was definite. And we have to remember the University of California system has 10 campuses a student body of 230,000 students, 19,000 faculty members, 135,000 staff members, and their official representing body of the students, the University of California Student Association, with a budget of $25 billion in the UC system, voted for BDS. That's huge. And the third victory is recent, the SOAS vote that just happened, just released on Monday, 73% of the students agreeing for an academic boycott of Israel, which the running joke in my family is, what happened to the other 27%? <laughs> <laughs> you know, 73% is really good. And these are just three victories, and I could go on and on and on. So we recognize that we're strong. And I have to say, on the recognition of another great leader who gave us inspiration and strength and humanity, this month marks the fifth, actually, February marks, the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Malcolm X. And I have to commemorate his life. And I have to recognize that Malcolm not only stood for teaching people of color that we are beautiful, but going beyond that and actually calling for human rights. He understood the concept of human rights to be connected to inherent human dignity. He understood that social conditions and relationships that support and enhance dignity. And he required the oppressed 
to commit themselves to political struggle. And he said, and I quote, we have to make the world see that the problem that we're confronted with is a problem for humanity. It's not a Negro problem. It's not an American problem. And I argue the same thing. The problem we Palestinians are confronted with is not a problem for Palestine. It's a problem for humanity. And it's not a Palestinian problem. It's not an Israeli problem. It's a problem for humanity. And I see it being liberated with humanity coming together. And we saw this when people in Ferguson, Missouri, responded to the killing of Mike Brown, an unarmed teenager on his way home to see his grandma, whose body was left for four hours bleeding in front of his grandma's home, that when they protested in Ferguson, Missouri, they were greeted with Palestinians in Gaza during the bombing, during the bombing, connecting to them and giving them advice as to how to deal with tear gas, because it literally is the same tear gas, both produced in the state of Pennsylvania, that attacked them both, and they connected. And the first place organizers in Ferguson, Missouri went to was Palestine. They went to Palestine. They understood it's the same struggle. They understood the similarities between the African Americans in the United States and the Palestinians in the land of Palestine are greater than the differences. And I would argue that here in the United Kingdom you can find the same. You can find the same. When I think of what liberation looks like and what justice looks like, I tend to think of children and something is happening to our children. They're becoming extraordinarily strong. Malak al-Khatib was a 14, remains a 14-year-old little girl who was arrested for doing something that is within her right to do. She was arrested for the allegation of throwing stones at an occupying force, which is a legal act. The Israeli occupying force took her and they detained her for two months. First thing she said when she was released, the very first thing she said when she was released is she said, we have no choice but to be strong and to show steadfastness. We will not kneel for the Zionist. <clears throat> and when I read her words, I thought, oh my God, our children are so strong and I will get my strength from them. And then my second thought was, what happened to our children? Because a child of 14, when she gets out of jail, if she should ever be in jail, should run into her mother's arms and her first statement should be, I miss you, Mama, and that we will not kneel. So also when we think of justice and liberation, let's also think of the right for children to actually have their childhood returned to them. And I go back to MLK, who one of the things he said about racism, I will paraphrase, into Palestine. The question is not, and I believe this deeply, not whether Zionism will be eliminated, not whether racism in our land will be eliminated. The question is only when and how fast. And the beauty of the BDS movement is it helps to accelerate that liberation. So thank you for your energy and your time. Uh, thanks very much, Rwanda, for an illuminating presentation. And I think that you've raised some very interesting issues. Uh, and I think there will be quite an interesting discussion. But before we go on to that, uh, I'll ask you to donate as much as you can because we need the funds because we're fighting uh, or we're trying to campaign during the election period for Palestine. Uh, I think it's also important that you write to your MPs and your candidates. So what I'll ask now is Chris, just a few minutes, to say what you don't want to get to. Uh, so I, I think. What, what we're going to do is run to sit down because I think uh, I'll ask people to raise some questions. But before I do that, there's a couple of announcements because a few things are happening. First of all, uh, there is Silent Voices exhibition of photos taken by children in the West Bank uh, in Palestine, and it's uh, in St. Martin in the Bull Ring uh, from the 9th of March to the 6th of April. Uh, and there will also be a prayer meeting in the church on the 25th of March, 2020. And there are some details about how you can find out more information. So if you want to come and collect that detail afterwards, but if you'd like, I'll give it to you now. You can email jillmy at awl.net. 
or you can ring her at 0121-443-519. Is that right? Yeah, I've got the information if you are. Uh, the, there's a silent voice, uh, a thought-provoking photographic exhibition in the village. Is that the same thing? It's the same exhibition, but okay. it's, if you are living in Mosley, Kings Heath, then you can see it in St. Mary's Church, and that's in Mosley. And it's Wednesday, Thursdays and Fridays from 10 to 12. They are very moving photographs. Cameras were given to children in the village of Belin, and they have taken photographs. And if you are around, please do make a contact. So, so that's in the whole month of March, is it? Or from, from uh, no, it is from 1st of March to the 13th of March in St. Mary's Church. And every day? Yes. No, for only Fridays, Thursdays and Fridays. Thursdays and Fridays. In the, in the St. Martin's Church, it's from the 9th of April to the 16th of April, mm -hmm. and it's all day, isn't it? I think so, yes. yes. They are open. And I think uh, the organizers have asked people whether they can volunteer to be there for a few hours in training. If, if anybody is interested, see me now and I can give you details, if you want to sort of help with staffing the place. Yes. Uh, the final announcement is that we need people to help us organize uh, the self and solidarity campaign, and we normally meet in this building. Uh, on the first Monday of the month, which is a committee meeting, but it's open to everybody, and we'll be meeting tomorrow from 7 p.m., uh, so you're all welcome to join us. And also on the third of, uh, Tuesday of the month as well, which is from 6.30, uh, again in the same building here, so you're welcome to join us. But the other thing you can do is, on our website, there's a thing to volunteer. And if you register your email address, you will get regular notifications of everything that's going on. So with that announcement, I'm going to take questions for people. So, yes. Uh, Sorry, I just wanted to ask you about the Sunday night session. Yes. Because I think you have some questions about that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Sunday night session is usually held on Wednesday night. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's usually held on the Wednesday night. Yeah. Uh, it's usually held on the Wednesday night. Yeah. Uh, it's usually held on the Wednesday night. Yeah. Uh, it's usually held on the Wednesday night. Well, I just, could you say something about the situation within the 48 boundaries mm -hmm. and with the elections coming up? Mm -hmm. Because I would expect, uh, whatever the outcome, we'll get the press again saying, oh, there's hope of, uh, you know, of some sort of negotiation and so on, if Netanyahu doesn't win and uh, the, the Lifley Labour Party mm -hmm. alliance mm -hmm. gets through. But the Zionist cap. Yeah, the Zionist <laughs> cap. <laughs> uh, if it, people remember that uh, when Lapid got uh, uh, a big number from the uh, joined the cabinet in Lipley. People were saying, oh, there's real hope of peace. And <laughs> both Lipley and uh, Lapid supported each other. But if you say something about the way that the Palestinian parties have united and whether you think that will make a difference and add to the, um, the growing strength that you talk about. Well, I think it's a good thing that the Palestinian parties within 1948 have united. Uh, I'm in a favor generally of Palestinian unity with just one exception. Um, but I, I don't expect anything to come from the elections. Just as any election between Labour and Likud, the only difference uh, for us has been the depth with which they stab us and not whether or not they will stab us. So will the knife go in all the way through or will it only cut through and, and kill me? You know? um, <laughs> But so there's no difference. And when there's no difference, I prefer honesty. So I would prefer Netanyahu to win. I would prefer a Likud to win. Because this, there, there's a farce called negotiation. There's a farce called the peace process. And we've seen what the peace process has done. Two very, very destructive things. One, it presented a facade of peace in the West Bank. Um, and this facade, therefore, did not allowed the media to cover the fact that settlements increased, that detentions increased, that home demolitions increased. All the while, the immediate result of the Oslo Accords more than 20 years ago was that the Arab governments, particularly in the Gulf, said, oh, we don't have to boycott anymore. There's peace. So you had a negative reaction. The second major problem that happened from those peace negotiations, again, quote unquote, is we had a massive increase in neoliberalism in the West Bank neoliberalism by definition. So now you, you not only have Palestinians in the West Bank that are burdened, crippled by the military occupation, but they're equally burdened and crippled by the economic practices of neoliberalism supported and planned by the Palestinian Authority. Okay. So if this is what 
a peace camp or the Zionist camp within Israel will be maintaining, which is the Oslo Accords. No, I am all in favor, all in favor of an Israeli leader that will take up, tear up those Oslo Accords and openly be doing what they're doing quietly. I mean, what difference does it make? So let's go with an honest killer rather than a killer who pretends mm -hmm. to be my friend. That's the only difference that there is. What I'm going to do next is take three questions and then you can come back. Abu? <coughs> you know, uh, interesting, uh, you know, your talk. Uh, you know, after the Charlie Hebdo massacre, mm -hmm. Netanyahu was caught on camera and microphone saying that, uh, that it, it's, it's a war against Islam. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, uh, what do you think about that and the Zionist contribution to Islamophobia globally? Mm -hmm. Chris? You got that? Yes, I got that. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, um, I've been in the West Bank three, three times with the National Solidarity Movement. And one of the things that I pick up quite a lot from the resistance committees is going back to what you just touched on about neoliberalism, is the way that the resistance